So I think we're about ready to begin. <clears throat> so good evening and welcome to the 17th Bertha Bassam Lecture presented by Lynn ha Professor Lynn Howitt. My name is Victoria Owen and I am the Information Policy Scholar Practitioner at the Faculty of Information. I have the privilege of welcoming you here tonight to what promises to be an enlightening and thought-provoking lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional land where we are gathering. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Acknowledging the land is an Indigenous protocol used to express gratitude to those who reside here and to honour Indigenous people who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. It allows us the opportunity to appreciate the unique role and relationship that each of us has with the land and provides a gentle reminder of the broader perspectives that expand our understanding to encompass the long-standing rich history of the land and our privileged role in residing here. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the Indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It's important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense or in a historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. And now I'd like to introduce today's event. The Bertha Bassam Lecture in Librarianship was established by the, faculty, uh, the faculty's Alumni Association to honor Dr. Bertha Bassam, who was the director of the library school from 1951 to 1964 and the founding member of the Faculty of Library and Information Science at the University of Toronto. This lecture provides the opportunity for an outstanding individual whose topic and experience are relevant to libraries and librarianship to deliver a lecture that offers a thought-provoking idea or reflection on the important societal role of information and cultural professions. Tonight, we are privileged to have Professor Lynn Howarth who will be speaking on the topic of Beyond Bindings and Binaries, the Information Professional in 2050. Professor Howarth is a professor and Dean Emerita at the Faculty of Information, the University of Toronto. With her extensive experience at the Faculty of Information and in the broad information community, she is well placed to provide us with insights into the future of the information professional and the challenges that we are facing in the coming years. The dynamic nature of the 21st century information landscape challenges us to revisit and rethink and indeed to re-envision how we create, disseminate and acquire new knowledge and new opportunities in the mass of data and in multi multiple media formats that technological advancements present to us. So I invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy what is going to be an inf insightful lecture on behalf of the faculty information and the Faculty uh, of Information's Alumni Association at the University of Toronto, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Lynn Howard and to all of you here tonight. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Boucher, who is the president of the University of Toronto Alumni Association, to say a few words. Jennifer. Thank you, Victoria. And welcome, everyone. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I'm Jennifer Boucher, and I'm the current president of the Faculty of Information Alumni Association. And we created this, uh, the faculty many, many years ago created this lecture uh, to honor Bertha Bassam, uh, who was the dean and, uh, and the founding member of, of, of the faculty, one of the founding members. Uh, so welcome to all of you, a heartfelt welcome on behalf of all the alumni. Uh, there are probably many of you in the audience tonight. and. Um, just a couple of notes about FIA, uh, the Faculty of Information Alumni Association. We are 
uh, a very dynamic group of individuals, and we have been active um, for many, many years. Uh, there's a couple past presidents in the audience that I can see, uh, and welcome to you. Uh, FIA has uh, worked very hard over the years to create lots of programming and, and events to support students and alum uh, throughout, throughout uh, the faculty. Uh, we do a couple of key programs uh, for, for students. One is our Ask an Alum program where we match students with alum and we ask alum to sit on alumni panels to provide mentoring and support for students and, and for students to be able to uh, connect with alum uh, for networking, but also just uh, to gain ex uh, insight and experience uh, from the alum. We also do grants and awards. Uh, we deliver many of those uh, to our students uh, to support attendance at conferences and their research. And uh, we honor outstanding students and alum as well with grants and awards. And then finally, uh, I just want to highlight our social events. Um, and upcoming, during alumni reunion, I want to invite you all We've got a couple events uh, coming up in June for alumni reunion. And uh, one is on June 1st, and it'll be a reception. And one is on June 3rd, which is a Saturday morning, which will be breakfast with the dean. So you are all welcome to come. More information will be available. Um, finally, I just want to mention uh, Dean Howarth. And we're here today to honor her. And uh, on behalf of the alum, um, I'm really happy and pleased uh, to be here and to welcome you all. Dean Howarth, we did a little digging, uh, and I asked uh, some of the faculty uh, staff to, to help with this. Dean Howarth, I'm calling you Dean Howarth because you were Dean when I was back in 1997 to 1999, so I am one of those uh, alum. 4,700 plus have taken a course with Lynn Howarth uh, throughout the course of her career here at U of T, 4,700 plus students. I'm one of them. There's a few more here. So uh, I really want to extend um, our thanks to you for your expertise and your knowledge throughout the years uh, for all of, those, all of those courses you've taught us. A um, couple quick stories. One is uh, the vice president of FIA right now shared a story about uh, Lynn Howarth uh, mentioning that she was sitting in a class about the Dublin Corps and didn't realize till halfway through the class that Lynn Howarth was instrumental in creating the Dublin Core. Uh, so thank you for that. Another story really quick too was uh, we were at our FIA social in February, our winter social, and um, one of the alum came up to, to a couple of us and we were mentioning the Birth of Bassam lecture and that Lynn Howarth would be delivering the lecture. And he said uh, he was at a conference, an international conference, kind of hanging out with Lynn Howarth and didn't realize what a rock star she was until everybody kept coming up and famous. Dean Howarth is Dean. See, I keep calling you Dean Howarth. I'm sorry. But in my mind uh, from many years ago, yeah, you'll always be Dean Howarth. But uh, just wanted to thank you on behalf of all the alum and welcome you and welcome you all. And uh, right now I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kara Kumpetich, who is the is a professor at uh, the faculty and also the director of the Museum Studies uh, program. And she'll say a few words about Dean Lynn Howard. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Great. It is a pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Lynn Howarth. And there are many reasons to be inspired by Lynn as a person and as a scholar. And given the theme of her talk tonight, I want to focus on the ways Lynn Howarth gets us thinking about the liberatory potential of cataloging. Such liberation comes from unmooring the cultural record that is records about cultural objects from their preconceived identities, and instead creating cultural records in ways that admit and make possible identities that exceed our expectations. Lynn Howarth's approach to cataloging, metadata, and knowledge organization is a leading example of the shift happening across galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, where classificatory systems are being reimagined to support plural, fluid, and even unanticipated identities. Her topic tonight, Beyond Bindings and Binaries, suggests we are going to push beyond 
bounded or delimited categories and lean into the rich meanings and complexities of information, knowledge, and life. In my own research and practice, I've taken inspiration from this liberatory ethos, and in particular, Lynn's work with her colleague, Hope Olson, in which they use the term surrogacy to describe the role and potential ability of cultural records. To act as surrogates for the items they describe, they are not passive representations, they are active instantiations, capable of encouraging creativity and meaning making. In its best form, surrogacy provides an environment that nurtures new life through new ideas and new relations. Lynn approaches those people she works with, folks living with Alzheimer's and dementia, indigenous seniors living in downtown Toronto, emerging librarians and knowledge organization folks. She leans into these folks as people with complex multidimensional identities and so perhaps Probably we shouldn't be surprised that she also treats cultural records, their cultural records, in the same way. But it is remarkable that she does all the same. So in this new environment that sustains new life, this is hospitality in its most generous sense. Not meeting the bare minimum for life to exist, but creating a welcoming and sustaining world. And this concern for life is essential to liberatory projects. Surrogacy is also intergenerational, and this speaks to Lynn Howard's capacity to bring people together, to encourage intergenerational and interdisciplinary company. And I would offer that you, our audience here tonight, are a testament to Lynn's ability to do this. And crucially, surrogacy is also the start of knowing, not the sum of our knowing. And so it's in that spirit that I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Patrick Kilty, who's going to start us knowing about Lynn's career, um, not as the summation, uh, but as an unfinished, in progress career still going. Oh, thank you so much, Kara. Um, and thank you to the fantastic staff who helped organize the event today, especially Aton, Claudia, Wendy, who's arrived. Thanks, Wendy. The Alumni Association, especially Jennifer. Uh, my introduction's going to take up slightly more time than I was allotted, um, just ever so slightly. And I know you've been waiting for Lynn to appear, but I promise the delay will only make uh, the eventual visibility even better. <laughs> um, as anyone who has seen me run faculty council knows, I don't usually like to run over, but our guest today deserves an exceptional introduction. It is truly an honor to introduce Lynn Howarth, a first-rate scholar, colleague, teacher, and mentor. Uh, my introduction today is actually taken from partly a, a special issue of Cataloging and Classification Quarterly that celebrates Lynn's extraordinary career, and it's a real high honor in the field to be given a festschrift. Um, that sort of uh, describes the influence you've had on the field. So if you're interested in that, I, I suggest you look at it. Um, few people have had as outside an impact on their field or profession as Lynn, one of her generation's preeminent cataloging and classification theorists. I first met Lynn as a candidate for a tenure track job here in the Faculty of Information, and she immediately impressed me from the start with her kindness and support, putting me immediately at ease on what might otherwise have been a stressful visit. Some of the things you told me on that day, Lynn, are things I say to job candidates now because they were so uh, good at sort of putting, putting someone who might be nervous at ease. And over the years, Lynn has shown me and countless others enormous intellectual and professional generosity. Perhaps her greatest gift to me has been her encouragement in the root sense of the word to give courage. She has given me courage during, our, during my first visit uh, uh, to present rather unorthodox research and she continues to inspire courage over a decade later. When Lynn announced her retirement earlier last year, a number of colleagues expressed their dismay. Uh, it, was, it, is, it is hard to imagine our faculty without her. 
After a career that spans nearly five decades, Lynn leaves behind a legion of successful graduates at the master's and doctoral level, innumerable, perf innumerable, innumerable professional and academic colleagues, and thousands of former library students, now librarians. Lynn has and remains a pillar of our faculty and of librarianship. Lynn's research reflects an enormous breadth and depth. By the time she earned tenure at the University of Toronto in 1995, she had studied the impact of computer-based technologies on workflow and cataloging departments, the interpretation of cataloging decisions and rules, cataloging and classification policy, the application of AACR2 in different contexts, and the transformation of management techniques within technical services in the context of enormous technological change. Shortly after receiving tenure, Lynn was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Venn Information Studies, a testament to her leadership skills and the confidence of her colleagues. Her research deepened and expanded in that time. For the next few years, Lynn's research aimed to improve the design of online displays and bibliographic records, an early example of studies into online library user interface, a sort of precursor to user experience design. One of her most cited studies examined the viability of paraprofessional positions in technical services given widespread automation and outsourcing. By 1999, Lynn had embarked on one of her most influential research areas, metadata. She developed a prototype metadata namespace of common categories as the basis of an end user assist that translated machine understandable metadata into a human understandable technological framework in order to assist researchers with effective navigation. As her research progressed, Lynn bemoaned the lack of cross-pollination between bibliographic control and metadata, advocating for greater convergence. Finally, Lynn's research on the transition from AACR2 to RDA is considered essential reading for cataloging scholars and historians, especially issues of seriality and the evolution of cataloging codes. Far from winding down her research activity after 30 years, Lynn's research momentum only increased in the 2010s, leading to some of her most fruitful, fruitful and cited studies, particularly concerning the relationship between classification, memory, and language by focusing on people with mild cognitive impairment resulting from early stages of dementia. Her interest in the effects of memory loss continue through the rest of her career, often refining earlier conclusions and making specific recommendations for the way cultural institutions can improve services to communities who experience cognitive difference. Her interest in memory led to a series of articles about the value of storytelling, which Kara has alluded to, um, and the ways in which objects can become a surrogate for memory. Lynn extended her research on memory into community-based projects that enabled community members to meaningfully engage objects that tell stories about their histories, focusing particularly on objects, on objects handmade by indigenous people and accessioned by the National Canadian Center of Toronto, National Can Native Canadian Center of Toronto, apologies. Lynn developed a method for creating the context of object records by inviting people of indigenous, by inviting a group of indigenous elders to handle and talk about the objects, um, a significant new approach for creating records for indigenous communities with indigenous communities. Finally, building on her prior research on memory, Lynn established her argument for the use of objects in storytelling to support people with Alzheimer's, um, putting a focus on people instead of the disease and envisioning ways cultural institutions might be designed to support person-centered care. What this incredible record of research activity over several decades demonstrates is an immense intellectual curiosity and commitment to improving technology and technical services, particularly for marginal communities. I can think of no one better suited or more deserving of delivering this year's Bertha Basson lecture than Lynn Howarth. I consider myself extraordinarily lucky to know her and to count her as a friend and colleague Please join me in welcoming Lynn Howarth. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Well, good, e good evening, everyone. Um, and after all of that, I'm, I'm sure if my mother were here, she wouldn't even recognize that uh, 
it, it was her daughter. And I'm deeply appreciative to uh, the words that have preceded the, uh, the presentation. Uh, it just increases the pressure that I'm going to have to meet a variety of expectations, uh, which I shall and now attempt to do. And, um, and first of all, to clarify, and, and thank you uh, very much, Kara, for sort of unearthing a little bit of the meaning behind uh, uh, bindings and binaries. I, I was saying to Jordan, who is the technician, maybe up there in the booth, I'm not sure, but that uh, the, the bindings referred to books and the binaries referred to technologies. And so Kara's right. We're going to move tonight uh, beyond books and technologies and uh, see if we can get a glimpse of what the information professional in 2050 might look like. Uh, I would like to also th thank you, Jennifer, for your very, very generous uh, introduction. You're welcome to call me Dean. You may be the last and only person who does, uh, but I'm, I, uh, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'd also uh, like to thank uh, Eden Rusnell, uh, Humja Chowdhury, and uh, Sue and Ki Kim, pardon me, of the, uh, who are FISA, FIA, Faculty of Information Alumni Association volunteers, Claudia Hughes, and Eitan Tobin, and Zainab Tayeb, all of whom were instrumental in uh, supporting me as I put together uh, this uh, Bassam lecture this evening. And uh, to colleagues, uh, Dean Wendy Duff, uh, who I believe you will hear more from her a little bit later. Uh, Victoria Owen, thank you for the introduction. Kara, for your friendship, colleagueship. And I hope when I grow up, I can write as well as you. And to Patrick, very, thank you for the very generous comments. And yes, I remember well uh, our first meeting when you were applying for a job. But, you know, <laughs> lips remain sealed on some matters. Uh, I'm also uh, very, very grateful to each and every one of you for, uh, for coming this evening, uh, not only for the lecture, but also for, for supporting the faculty, its students, and its very accomplished and special graduates, uh, now alumni, many of you among them. Uh, so I'm sort of thinking that uh, you can either uh, come for the lecture and stay for the food and drink, or come for the food and drink and persevere through the lecture. <laughs> now, I, I thought, since uh, many of you are uh, graduates of the faculty program, that I would, uh, would start with a, with a quiz. <laughs> and no cheating. Your cell phones are off. No cheating. Um, so... Uh, just in case this is a helpful hint, you know, when you get to call someone to help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, any, any uh, thoughts about what that might retrieve? History? Uh, well, you're getting warmer. Literature. Literature. Ah, aha. We have a classification scholar amongst us. <laughs> any other thoughts? You do, you do get a prize. You get an extra ticket for a drink. Oh, look at all those hands. <laughs> Shakespeare. Well, <laughs> you may be disappointed. <laughs> well, um, okay, uh, because we're on a schedule, and we really are on a schedule, I'll, uh, I'll give you the answer, and here we are. So uh, does anyone uh, wish to uh, self-admit that they've read this? Some, yeah. <laughs> Wait till the evening's over. You'll all be uh, putting your hands up. Um, this is Audrey uh, Niffenegger's uh, Time Traveler's Wife, uh, which was adapted for an HBO series. Uh, I understand, sadly, it, it had one season, one season only. But for my purposes, what I found fascinating about this is that it is about a rare genetic disorder called chromo impairment, which causes involuntary travel through time. And that the uh, lead character in this was uh, a librarian um, who served at the Newberry Library, uh, no less. So um, what I'd like to uh, invite you to uh, do, and to bear with me over the next 45 minutes, as a time traveler within the universe of information and those who inhabit it in their daily work and uh, personal lives. Uh, I do want to add one more thing. Um, uh, Jennifer mentioned that um, uh, she, she didn't realize she was 
in the presence of a rock star, and nor did I until I got this microphone <laughs> somewhere here on my body, which it's sort of like Lady Gaga, so <laughs> dream, dream come true. Okay, so enough of that, um, because I stand between you and food and drink. Um, so uh, I'd just like to um, offer a brief uh, nod to Dr. Bassam. Uh, then we'll have a look at, I promised you, in, if you read the blurb for this, this talk, uh, in addition to looking at books and uh, technologies beyond bindings and binaries, I also said that we would, um, ex uh, we would look at a framework for considering the information professional in 2050. Uh, so... Let's go on to some of this you've already heard. So I think uh, I would just add to that that Dr. Bassam, in addition to being uh, the director of the first library school, um, she was also the author of um, uh, the Faculty of Library Science, University of Toronto and its predecessors, 2011, pardon me, 1911. I'm in that chrono genetic thing. Uh, 1911 to 1972, published on the uh, 50th anniversary of the faculty and the 150th anniversary of the University of Toronto in um, 19, oh dear, uh, well, 50 years, 1978, there we go. Uh, now, if that has kind of put a burning desire in your heart, you can get it from the, the University of Toronto archives. Okay, and uh, again, a thanks to the Alumni Association for uh, sponsoring the, uh, the, the lecture and having established it in her name. Okay, so uh, now that um, we've uh, got all of that stuff out of the way, um, I'd like to now have a look at the uh, framework. And uh, it's just a different framework than uh, that'll get us to 2050, uh, something other than a TARDIS or the, uh, the chrono impairment gene. And I'd, I'd like to start off with an explanation of this slide. So uh, ten, 10 years ago in January of 2013, during a conference on the changing face of library and information science education, colleagues Professor Eileen Abels, who was dean at, the, at Simmons College Boston, and uh, Professor Linda Smith, uh, associate dean at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, their faculty of information, and I, uh, we had a conversation motivated by our own personal concerns about the vitality and future relevance of our respective programs. In January 2015, two years later, committed to ensuring that library and information science graduates would have opportunities to pursue a full range of careers, and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a United States uh, government uh, agency, a national planning forum entitled Envisioning Our Information Future and How to Educate for It, con convened a diverse group of stakeholders to develop a framework for revisioning LIS education and to begin um, action planning within that framework. Uh, the forum participants included 53 individuals from North America, ranging from directors of libraries, and including uh, the um, uh, United States archivist, uh, the, um, librarian, uh, the Librarian and Archivist of Canada and other luminaries, um, digital humanities scholars, content providers, futurists, including Nicholas Negroponte, and entrepreneurs at various stages of their careers. So a very diverse group of individuals. The participants at the forum identified key themes to be explored in greater depth to revision library and information science education. They proposed the development of proofs of concepts to address key themes related to the future of LIS education. Who do we teach? Who will we teach? How will we teach? And who will teach our students? Now, when we entered the, um, the, the working space, uh, we were met with this display board, which read, if you can't see it from where you are, welcome to 2045. Uh, and the subtitle of that was, How We Got to Now. 
So this was the, the first of several activities that challenged us to get out of our present situation and contemplate a future, a future in the case of the forum being 2045, that was represented as the here and now. So we were on that chromo, you know, impairment gene thing uh, going to 2045. You're going to go another five years to 2050 tonight. So the, the first activity invited participants to identify and record along a timeline stretching from, quote, the beginning to, quote, 2045 and beyond. Uh, and the timeline was a, a long stretch of poster paper. We were to record, um, as we thought of them, noble events in the evolution and life of information. So anyone could get up, put something on, on the sheet, and it was really uh, impressive to watch it fill, uh, especially given the diversity of the participants. So that long stretch of poster paper was soon populated by milestones, such things as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Library at Alexandria, illuminated manuscripts of the medieval period in Europe, the Gutenberg Press, first pressed into service at, in 1450, the first library school founded by Melville Dewey, he of the Dewey Decimal Classification at Amherst College in 1884, Vannevar Bush's 1945 article, As We May Think, which uh, foreshadowed the idea of a thinking machine, machine called the Memex or Memex. The IBM 701 in 1952, that being the first commercially available mainframe. The emergence of library automation systems. The University of Toronto library automation system here in Canada and OCLC, uh, both of which um, developed during the 1970s. Then there was the Intel 4004 microprocessor in 1971. Any of you heard of a microchip? A microprocessor. Uh, there was the establishment of Project Gutenberg, the first digital library in 1971, and the very first digitized document was the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's a, an American project. Uh, the official birth date of the internet in 1983, the invention of the World Wide Web by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989, followed shortly by IBM's release of the first smartphone in 1992. In 1997, the same year that IBM's chess playing and AI application supercomputer Deep Blue beat Gary Gasparov, the Kasparov, pardon me, the world's uh, reigning chess champion. Uh, and then there was the founding of Facebook in 20, 2004, Apple Computer's release of Siri in 2011, and so on. Uh, I figure you're, we're getting close to your, your age range here <laughs> in, the, uh, in the audience, so I, I won't go on. So I just gave you the older ones that you might not remember or experience firsthand. So that stretch of timeline uh, illustrated for us at the forum uh, the logic of where we had come based on where we had been. Uh, the future is indeed rational, but only in hindsight. Yet, it is not unknowable. Just forgive the double negative, not unknowable. When we consider what 2050 might hold for those of us working as information uh, professionals or training our future information professionals, the past and present provide clues as to how we might realistically achieve a future by design, not by default. The 2015 National Forum on Envisioning Our Information Future had walked us through a paper timeline of past, present, and future. What we needed next was a framework for making sense of instances along that evolutionary path. So this was the framework that uh, well, I'll get to that framework in just a second. Um, so, uh, what, what, we're, what, we were, uh, what I'm asking you to do this evening is to think about how we actually get there from here. 20, it's only 27 years in the future. Uh, I'm sure many, most of you can uh, remember what it was like 27 years ago in 1996. And so, that's really this time shifting, uh, the, the, the time traveler's uh, wife syndrome there. We're, we're time shifting back and forth. 
But in thinking about 27 years from now, we have as, concept, as context the 27 years um, from just behind us. So in other words, by, although the future is not predicted by the past or present, it is informed by them. And again, the future is rational only in, in hindsight. So when we're thinking about the information professional in 2050, we're actually thinking about a future by design, not by default. Okay, so here are the uh, three elements that uh, I started to speak to just a minute ago, referred to. And uh, let me just say right off the top, uh, they're in no particular order or sequence. Uh, they are not meant to imply any particular prog progression. So decaying is not the last stage. Emergence Im is not necessarily the first stage. Rather, there's an ecology, an interdependence, and an intertwining among them. So you might imagine a tree with lots of intertwined roots. That's kind of the idea for that. And I'll show you a graphic in just a second that illustrates that. So uh, if we uh, think about the, the, uh, the timeline that, that I talked about earlier, that, uh, that, um, that paper timeline, and we apply it to, say, books, uh, that, that we, we see that while the Gutenberg Press was invented around 1450, and we might anticipate that uh, printed text might by now be characterized as decaying, it's a long time since 1450, at least last time I checked, Recent trends in publishing, in public library borrowing practices, in the popularity of children's literature in bookshops, might suggest that printed books are still dominant, central, of continuing importance and relevance. And while eight-track tape, anyone remember eight-track tape, came and went relatively quickly, the predicted demise of the hardcover and paperback in favor of the e-book has not materialized. Instead, we see so-called old and new artifacts coexisting to suit human tastes and preferences. Uh, in, in, in instead of demise and disappearance, there's a proliferation. So here's, uh, so decaying what is fading, losing importance or relevance, maybe disappearing or not. What still exists is important or relevant or central and holds sway. And what is starting to come forward, gain importance or relevance, decaying, dominant, and emerging. So here's a little graphic, uh, I hope. Whoops. You have to push the right button. Uh, Lady Gaga's better at this than I am. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a very busy slide, but luckily I have my trusted, I think I, oh yes, my trusted, she's even better at pointers, but anyway. Uh, so you can sort of see this is a, a sort of a picto pic, picture of this. So uh, the idea being that as certain things begin to lose sway uh, and um, maybe um, are, are less, uh, less relevant and so on, that's that decaying uh, substrate right there. And uh, out of that substrate, we have uh, the emergence of new and uh, potentially in, uh, Relevance, uh, relevant and increasing relevant, relevant, increasingly relevant. I needed an adverb. Increasingly relevant um, uh, things happening, and uh, of course the dominant on the uh, right up here. That's just something that has taken root, if you will, continues to have relevance, importance, is seen to be uh, fairly, fairly stable. Uh, but there's some other things on this slide in case you can't see them. Uh, there, there are some fast and slow components. So uh, this is what makes things resilient. It doesn't all happen at once. It doesn't all happen slowly. It doesn't all happen quickly. Uh, there are varieties of rates of emergence and so on. So um, fast learns, slow remembers, fast proposes, slow disposes, fast is discontinuous, and slow is continuous. So while fast gets all the attention, slow has all the power. So this is what it, it is described as a healthy society. Uh, each substrate or each uh, level operates at its own pace, and there's a mix of slow and fast to kind of keep things in an equilibrium. So that's um, 
that's a, a framework that uh, we used as, as part of our future search uh, at the forum. And I would propose we could have a look at that uh, as well. Okay, so, well, yeah, right, we have to do the correct button. So I, I'm just going to uh, take a couple of minutes to um, see how that might work relative to some things that we know. So uh, first of all, the, the Faculty of Information, which has been around a, a long time, coming up to 100 years, so 95 at the moment. It's a pretty spry 95. And uh, have a look at that. And then just as part of that, looking at the information landscape of 2023. Okay, so this is a very busy slide. Uh, so I'm going to go through this and uh, then get back to the slow slide. So I'm demonstrating those different substrates, how they emerge and otherwise slow and fast. I just made that up. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the three-element framework does, does say something about how things wax and wane across time. Um, how states of being evolve, it's, uh, it's organic by nature, it's resilient, it's sustained but it, what has been laid down as a base and invigorated by what grows out of it. So here we are on, the, on your left. We have the original University of Toronto Library School, 1928, founded within the Ontario College of Education. And what we can see across the, uh, oops, well, we can't see anything at the moment. Uh, just a second here. Okay, there we go. Uh, you, on the evaluation sheet, I'm fine if you want to like circle the zero for ability to work with the, uh, the pointer. Uh, so what happened across 60 years? Well, um, essentially, and I'll just put all these out here. Essentially what we see, 1928 to 1988, there's a focus on providing the theory and practice of library science. Uh, with the growth of computer and information technologies and their increasing use in libraries and the pub public sphere more generally, a Master of Science degree appears in 1988. Less than 10 years later, the Master of Library Science and the Master of Information Science degrees are replaced in 1995 by the Master of Information Studies a broadening of the lens of curriculum to incorporate information as product, as service, information as process, so including the life cycle of the record, supported by information uh, and computer technologies. And we see a move from a diploma in librarianship to a Master of Information Studies that took nearly 70 years, but in less than 30 years, the Master of Information Studies has evolved to a Master of Information, renamed in 2008 within the Faculty of Information with multiple degree programs, including uh, the Master of Museum Studies and a combined degree program in Information Studies and Museum Studies. And we also see a Master of Information uh, degree program with a variety of specialization. So you could look at these and sort of do your own reckoning as to what we might consider uh, to be emergent, uh, some that we see as being dominant, and I would suggest um, with, without um, uh, playing to the crowd that there are none here that uh, would be considered to be decaying, although we can see within each probably many of the, the programs, that there's, you know, waxing and waning, things come and go. So uh, those specializations, along with the Master of Museum Studies degree program, reflect that broad base of information from human-centered design of applications to the life cycle from inception to preservation of the human memory and cultural record within libraries, archives, and museums, that is, cultural heritage institutions. We see theory and practice embedded within each specialization, along with critical approaches to how we think about information within different institutional, public, educational, governmental, or private settings, not to mention in the design and tool of tools and applications for creating, disseminating, using, and interpreting information. The fingerprints of the uh, information landscape 
as it exists in 2023, can be readily identified in the Faculty of Information and the education of its students and graduates in 2023. Some aspects of specialization may now be fading or losing their relevance or importance, while at the same time others are gaining relevance and importance coming forward, emerging. Now, while each specialization has a resilience based on this ebb and flow, it also has a vitality and a, a notice and a, pardon me, an openness to change. It is not static. So I'd like to, uh, sort of having set that past, present, um, take a look at, at the future. And I'm calling this right-sizing the gap. So within the, while the biosphere of information within which schools and faculties of information educate their students is constantly evolving, and while programs are continuously reviewed and updated to account for change, do we possess the right stuff yet? the gene that will equip us with the skills, aptitudes, and attitudes we need to thrive, not only in 2023, but over the next 27 years to 2050, the future as I've defined it for tonight. Of course, the answer may be, that depends. That depends on how well we understand our current information landscape, how we got here, uh, what we have and are dealing with, and what gaps, what opportunities and potential pitfalls may appear. So for a moment, let's think again about 2023. To say that the past three years have been tumultuous may not be an exaggeration. The world has endured through a COVID-19 pandemic. It continues to be threatened by the increasingly severe effects associated with a warming climate. It's witnessing a heightening of tensions between so-called autocratic and democratic states and societies. It is struggling to accommodate an unprecedented wave of human migration and responding to the first war, first war on European soil since 1945. On the information side, we see uh, in many parts of the world greater access to information essential to human education, health, general well-being, and to communicating broadly with others, all in real time and inform society, while also experiencing the worst of instant social media, of trolls and bots, of fake news and the dark web, of deep fakes and flash financial sell-offs that threaten the stability of banks, stocks, uh, those are two separate words, banks, stocks, and more importantly, individual livelihood. And closer to home, chat, GPT-4, which is human competitive in its ability to write prose and high quality academic papers, you put on notice. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is hardly new. Remember Deep Blue of 1997 and research going back to Memex and Alan Turing and making periodic appearances since then. Think of Siri, Alexa, self-driving cars, and one of my least fades, something called slaughterbots, also called lethal autonomous weapons, uh, sorry, lethal autonomous weapons systems or killer bots. These are all examples of AI in action. It's again in the news. And just in time for the Bertha Bassam lecture, that open letter issued yesterday, March 29th, by the Future of Life Institute. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, okay. Uh, signed by AI luminaries and researchers, among them Elon Ma Musk. I almost said Musk, pardon me, Musk. <laughs> Must be Musk, anyway. Uh, it calls on all artificial intelligent labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. No more writing of those academic papers. If such a pause cannot be enacted quickly, the open letter says, Governments should step in and institute a moratorium. In other words, we're looking at the intervention of governments for uh, very serious regulation. Catch up, you guys, is the subtext to that. So this uh, brings me to a key question for um, information professionals. What about the robots? 
Now, that sounds to me like a call to a future by design, not default. So what about the robots? It seems a real possibility that this time, <coughs> information and cultural professionals of all stripes could be ready, readily replaced by a human competitive intelligence. That's what they are, human competitive intelligence, that even looks somewhat human-esque, maybe even cute. How's, how's it feel? Even as Google was predicted to replace the librarian, demise is not always an outcome, with adaptation and greater opportunity often resulting instead. Libraries have evolved to be purveyors of books and information, binaries, uh, bindings and binder binaries, uh, yes, and also trusted uh, places and spacement places and spaces for engagement with others, for study, for debate, and for community initiatives, for the exchange of skills, and the sharing of expertise. So it's uh, not only what is there, but how uh, we use the what is there, whether it's the product or the, the space, and the people, of course. Okay. Um, in the... Uh, current landscape, we, we understand uh, that something that affords the exchange of information free may not be free at all. The suite of Google applications is one example, including a phenomenal search engine and free email platform, Gmail, extracts our information and sells it to third parties. The, and all you have to do is click the yes, that you, will, you agree, and then you get to use the application. If you click no, then you don't seems like a, a, has a fairness to it. Um, so this is common knowledge, and it's also true for social media platforms and applications, uh, such things as uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. You know, the, you know the, the menu there. Advertising and user profile metadata are the lifeblood of highly lucrative social media enterprises and also for so-called service uh, platforms, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, and so on. This is our individual deal with the devil, so to speak, at least until now. Uh, individuals can also be outed on platforms such as Twitter, compromising not only their privacy, but also their sense of personal safety. The circulation of false or falsified information, of so-called fake news, of altered or manufactured images, represent the worst of digital propaganda, propaganda and defamation. Propaganda, defamation, deceit are not new. They have a long history. They are simply delivered differently. Those who are educated, employed as information professionals are bound by professional ethics. While receiving a paycheck, they have no uh, expectation that in exchange for information provided, the user or client will surrender personal information. There may be a fee-for-service model, but such is contractual and regulated. That, that said, freely given and no or low-cost information devoid of some hidden exchange, uh, not a compelling reason for keeping information professionals for ensuring their meaningful existence and livelihood to and beyond 2050. Rather, it may be said, at least in my opinion, a potent mix of human skill and intelligence when it comes to information, products, and processing, or as Charles Cutter said uh, in 1904, the right information to the right person at the right time, when you take that combined with a less tangible and less well-defined human emotional intelligence, perhaps something like the right information to the right person at the right time and in the right way emerges. A human understanding of another human need delivered in a right-sized human way. Programs of education for information and cultural professions regularly review and revise curriculum to accommodate new developments in what is delivered to an end user or client and how it is provided, tools, applications, approaches, etc. There's another element which, again in my opinion, deserves a closer look and perhaps greater emphasis when we think about how to prepare the information professional of 2050 to be resilient as well as intelligent and highly skilled. While people have largely been at the center of education and training around product and process, 
around bindings and binaries, whether in information and cultural institutions or in the design of humor, human computer interfaces and technologies. Perhaps a great emphasis on human factors and relationships may be relevant to our learning and preparation for the future. Towards the end of uh, 2022, the Toronto Foundation released the Toronto Social Capital Study 2022, described as an, an invaluable tool used to explore the well-being of a city and its residents. Social capital refers to the vibrancy of social networks and the extent to which individuals and communities trust and rely upon one another. It is a key ingredient in making communities productive, healthy, inclusive, and safe. Social capital can be seen as a resource that communities can draw upon to respond to crises through collaboration and mutual support, while also a resource that can be depleted, leaving communities less well positioned to face what comes next. The first essential dimension of social capital, social networks, describes uh, the presence and quality of personal connections that individuals have with others. A second essential dimension, social trust, is defined as the extent to which individuals trust or distrust others with whom they interact, generally and in terms of specific groups and institutions. Higher scores on each dimension of social capital, that is, uh, social, social networks and social trust, higher scores on those dimensions correlate positively to measures of well-being. I suggest that ensuring that we embed a greater understanding of the nature, importance, and benefit, uh, beneficial application of social capital, of developing vibrant and robust social networks and fostering social trust may add further to the resilience of our information biosphere and to those who work within it. Information professionals are adaptive, flexible, know where to find what they don't know, and smart, not unlike robots or other human competitive intelligent agents. Information professionals are also human, which makes us distinctive and unique. It is the je ne sais quoi of the sauce. While robots and other intelligent agents may very well replace information professionals in terms of generating and disseminating information, part of our, uh, part of our professionals, which is part of our professional uh, skill set and expertise, uh, robots will not likely replicate or replace our humanness, our ability to establish quality connections and trust with other humans. As yesterday's open letter from the Future of Life Institute strongly urges, we need to ensure that human agency prevails, that we plan and manage advanced AI with commensurate care and resources, and that we not surrender our control as creators. That's quoted from the open letter. That we not surrender our control as creators, a further quote, to non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us unintended consequences, and not a future by design. I should also add, uh, just to be fair, that the open letter speaks to a pause for at least six months uh, so that, um, that there can be a level of review and a set, uh, the development of a set of shared safety protocols for advanced AI design and development that are rigorously audited and overseen by independent out experts, outside experts. These protocols should ensure that systems adhering to them are safe beyond a reasonable doubt. This does not mean a pause on AI development in, in general. Not, there are not Luddites here. Merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever larger, unpredictable black, black box models with emergent capabilities. Currently, the letter speaks to AI labs that are locked in an out-of-control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. There, there is an, a note of encouragement, however. AI research and development should be refocused on making today's powerful, state-of-the-art systems more accurate, safe, 
interpretable, transparent, robust, aligned, trustworthy, and loyal. Stay tuned. Patrick, how are we doing for time? Oh, oh well, in that case. <laughs> so um, I, I've been very pleased to uh, receive recently uh, an email that has uh, the subject line, Lynn, that's always hopeful. Lynn, support what sparks you at the Faculty of Information. And it begins, it, it's a, a lovely uh, message. And it, uh, well, let me just read it to you, since I now have 4.5 minutes. Uh, for generations, the Faculty of Information has been a catalyst for brilliant minds to discover and cultivate their spark. My spark for creating positive change, and this is a, a student, a Master of Information student, 2024, will be graduating. Uh, my spark for creating positive change was ignited at the Faculty of Information. Inspired by the power of information and data to improve lives, I came to the University of Toronto to study ethical machine learning models and explore how policies and other standards can be used to create a more just society by reducing racial biases and creating a more inclusive environment. I truly believe, the student continues, that information and data have the potential to create transformational change. As a child, my life was saved when a neighbor shared information with my family about an impending attack on our village at the start of the Rwandan genocide. I'm determined to carry forward that gift by leveraging the power of information technologies and systems to create a safer and more equitable society for everyone. Uh, to paraphrase Mr. Rogers, you all know Mr. Rogers? Yeah, good, okay. I, I didn't want to go into that. <laughs> He's even more of a star than Lady Gaga. To paraphrase Mr. Rogers, there's only one person in the whole world like you. I suggest that applies to the information and cultural profession of 2050, as it does in 2023, and for that matter, throughout the course of evolution, both human and information. May I reassure you that we're far from decaying. Thank you. That was indeed thought-provoking, and we have uh, mobile um, microphones if anybody would like to have a question or an observation of Lynn uh, about her talk. Anybody? Here's one. Thank you. So I want to ask uh, regarding artificial intelligence today. Is it already smarter and can do things that humans cannot do? I, I almost feel like I, I should defer to you, yeah. Matt, to take that on. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I was confused. Uh, uh, is, it true that, is it true that the AI systems are smarter hmm, than, humans. than humans? But you were talking about robots, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Good answer. I mean, what, what do you... Sorry, sorry, I'm asking the... Of course. Okay, okay, okay. I, I was just trying to share. Um, uh, well, of course, what, uh, what, what uh, AI systems can do, and Matt, forgive me if I say something in grave error, uh, <laughs> what they can do is uh, quickly, far more quickly than we as humans can do, go through vast amounts of data and pull out relevant information and package it. So that, uh, and, and that's what it's really, really good at. Um, un unlike some of us, you know, I sometimes characterize myself as the squirrel uh, sort of person. Yeah, that we, we get distracted. We go from here to there to there to there. Eventually we may get to the same place, but an AI system has the data, vast, access to vast amounts of data, pick and choose, and come up with um, whatever it is you ask it to do. And by Fair? 2050, is there a danger that they, it will become more smarter than humans by your age of 2050? Okay, well, uh, uh, the, 
that's that's not uh, what what I would say uh, because I'm not qualified to say that. But the uh, the open letter on on uh, the pausing artificial intelligence essentially said, let's take six months. They do refer to the summer as coming in. We'll enjoy the summer. I thought that was really nice. <laughs> I hope the robots take the summer off. No, no. <laughs> By the pool, you know, um, <laughs> sipping on their daiquiris. Uh, but seriously, um, they're just saying take a pause because right now it's going so fast. And it's right now, it's, it's competitive because it is commercial. It's already becoming highly uh, uh, successful commercially. And so there's sort of, a, it's sort of like an arms race, if you will, to who can get the next great product out there. Right now, GPT-4, uh, as I understand it, is um, you know, the gold standard. So they're saying, let's live with the gold standard. Let's look at the gold standard. Let's not do anything beyond GPT-4 for now, at least for six months. See what the implications are. Put into place any necessary safeguards. And uh, they do use uh, that strong uh, language about um, being careful that non-human competitive intelligence, in fact, overtakes us. Because when you take a lot of data and put it all together and come out with an, a an answer. This is what you're doing. You're not necessarily considering this and this. This is when distraction can be helpful because it may open you to other possibilities. So far, so good? Okay. Yeah. I, is that on? Yes. yes. Uh, an observation that I make is it seems that this discussion happened around genetic engineering as well that the science was moving too fast and scared a lot of people. It brought a lot of benefits and it probably will help us get through climate change in many ways. Uh, but it also scared people. And so it's kind of, um, to me, this reflects th that I'm glad that this discussion is going on because it's as important. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I consider it a great gift, deus ex machina, that this open letter arrived yesterday. Because, um, you know, it was a little scary changing what I had to say, but it was, it was I thought, thank goodness, because my message was going to be uh, information professionals may be engaged in trying to influence some directions. Well, uh, the AI community, the researchers, and those who are deeply involved are already doing that. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take an alternative point of view. Um, Elon Musk is using his institute that is fully funded by him to release uh, something that protects his business interests, and he doesn't. And he needs to have Twitter and self-driving cars and everything catch up. So what we need to say to ourselves: Do we, as academics and librarians, support the idea of pausing science. I think that is anathema to everything we believe. I think asking somebody to not release new versions, in six months, we will be overwhelmed by all the versions that are happening in the back office. Mm -hmm. So I think this idea on further examination only supports the word stupid. Yeah, and an and ex excellent point. Um, I, I don't know that, uh, and I'm certainly not uh, advocating that as information professionals, we, we stop anything. What I'm saying is that we use what we know how to do best, which is to learn more about things we do not know, do not understand. We know the tools to look for, and we know how to interpret them and uh, how to make sense of them, how to put them in context, how to position them relative to another position. And you're absolutely right. It was definitely not uh, lost on me that uh, two of the prime signatories, one, uh, of course, Elon Musk, and then the, uh, one of the co-developers of the, the first Apple computer, um, that, yeah, there are definitely interests in there. There are also, among the, as of midnight last night, 1,240 signatories, a lot of 
active AI researchers, and so on. So I, I, I take the point about there may be um, uh, vested interest, folks with massive vested interest, trying to buy time. But I do not think it necessarily negates the point that as of today, we have the killer bots. We have developed AI technologies which uh, even their developers may not be fully versed or fully understand just exactly what they've built, especially as they are, uh, they are themselves learning machines. They learn. They can continuous learners. We're continuous learners. We're just not as fast. We don't have access to as much data. So I don't think I, I agree with you um, on the vested interest point, but I do think we it, it, they raise a good point on a broader level of pausing to say. Uh, and by the way, sorry, this is an aside. I look back at 1996, um, and that was the year that Dolly the sheep. Remember Dolly? Hello, Dolly. Yeah. Um, that Dolly was, I was going to say born, hatched, whatever, created. Um, and uh, probably, some, uh, you know, undoubtedly some of that research has continued. But we're not seeing dollies and dollies and dollies and dollies running around, at least not in the public sphere. So, you know, there were people who questioned. Uh, people who questioned around things like ethics. Uh, within the profession, we learn about information ethics and ethical information delivery and that sort of thing. Uh, advocacy, um, making informed decisions and helping others, giving them the tools uh, to make informed decisions uh, and not influencing them one way or the other. Okay, uh, I, I'm proud there? to say we are the, we are the bastion of... Uh, Drag queen storytelling, too. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lynn. Um, nice I, to see you, Grant. Yes. <laughs> um, since we're talking about the, uh, the bright new future, uh, someone's got to bring up Mark. Um, it strikes me it's that one thing... It's an inside joke, in case you yes, didn't Yes, yes, this is an yeah. inside joke, yeah. <laughs> um, it strikes me that one of the things patterns in the past that's useful for the future is the way in which um, the LIS community and the catalogers in particular have managed the proliferation of new things that happen and then their gradual absorption back into something fairly something fairly similar to what there was. So when Mark first came out, there was a Mark standard for every kind of material. Sorry, can I, just for those who may not, uh, Mark, uh, when I first started library school, they talked about Mark and LC, which I thought was a couple. Turns out, <laughs> it turns out it was a standard for <laughs> recording information for machine information exchange, and LC was Library of Congress classification. Okay, yeah. sorry, Grant. So, so everything was new, and they brought out this whole you know, range of standards, and then gradually we figured out there, there's always a Lubetsky in, in librarianship who says, okay, let's, let's single up to the stern wire, let's find out what are the core things that are happening, and let's simplify again. And I think librarianship has always been very good at managing that first proliferation into wild chaos, and then as it all seeps down, I guess into that lower layer you, were, you, you had on your slide, figuring out, okay, how have, how have the really core landmarks changed? And I think if there's one thing we can predict is that there are going to be more explosions of proliferation of chaos, and then somebody figures out, okay, what does that mean down at the lower level? And I think librarianship has always been very important for that. Yeah, thank you. I, I think definitely chaos has, like so many of the things that I refer to, has always been with us. Hi, Lynn. Hi. I was in your metadata class. <laughs> um, Did it help? Uh, yeah, right now I'm doing cataloging. Oh, <laughs> life is good. Um, I was curious because we, 
we've been talking about ChatGPT a lot and um, the potential for AI to do a lot of the work faster that a cataloger might do in terms of copy cataloging, ca cataloging and um, and I was thinking about like certain technologies we use, like cell phones, that we offload the numbers and certain information in order to like. Are there? Do you see that like? Um, with that information offloaded into a technology, there's more space for the person to do something else? Or like, how, how do you see that space filled for the information professional? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I, I think uh, that Grant's point about that we can draw from, from our history and, and tradition, uh, one of the things I would say, again, that, that we're really, uh, really good at is interpreting. Now, when you've got language, of course, and that, that's the real strength of of, um, of uh, AI that, that does I important things, makes connections and so on with language uh, and in very large quantities. But often we might think of the word nuance. And while uh, I think it would be fair to say that um, AI is devoid of uh, capabilities or capacities for nuance, I think humans are really, really good at it. Uh, particularly within cultures, different cultures, and within cultures where there may be, or human conditions where there may be ambiguity. Um, and I'm, I don't know how people are receiving that, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's the subtleties that the, the human excels at. And partially because that we're slower. We have a chance to look here and there and, you know, uh, pick things up along the way and change our minds, uh, which is not to say that AI doesn't change its mind either. It continues, it learns continuously. Um, and especially if you say, no, that's not right, go do it again, then it's going to iteratively learn. So it's very, very good at doing that. Um, so I would say uh, nuance, cultural sensitivity, dealing with ambiguity. Uh, now, how does that help a, a cataloger? Well, uh, working with your communities, and sometimes, uh, and I, I advocate very strongly for catalogers being with a community and interpreting for them, uh, so that you can take something that maybe someone, you know, someone is not going to be able to uh, say to you, oh yes, I want that to be an 813.56, please. Uh, that's a Dewey Decimal Classification. I have no idea what it is. Um, so, no, they're not going to do that. They're going to tell you a story, and you are going to interpret it. Um, Hope Olson and I did a, a little bit of work, which um, uh, unfortunately we, uh, we didn't get around to publishing, but looking at the health records, individuals' health records, and how they might interpret them. And was there some way that as uh, professionals who know how to represent things and represent them either following a standard or following a different kind of protocol, that that might be a really interesting area to get into. In other words, interpreting and expressing, being mindful of the community, not, you gotta be with the community. Part, you, know, you may not be a part of it, but you've gotta be with it and realize that you could be wrong and you need to be open to change. But that, that, that might be a, an avenue to pursue. Uh, does that make some sense? Lynn, I'm, I'm your colleague, but I wish I had been your student. And I just want to recognize your attention to history. There was a lot of history in your talk tonight. And I don't think we give it enough attention. And I wish we had a very basic history of information course in our curriculum. But that's not my main comment. <laughs> but that could be I, your next course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, I just want to put some ideas forward for you in light of your presentation and get your input. What if the age of data and information has simply grown hopelessly dysfunctional and it is passing and we're in the death throes of it now? In the future, the frontier are higher levels of understanding and wisdom and self-knowledge. 
And what's necessary is for library and information science to grow less enchanted with the information age and guide us into the frontier. Because Lynn, actually, I think what marks you as a teacher and leader is your wisdom. So, your well, comments. Yeah, yeah, my, my quick answer to that is I retired. <laughs> and that's sort of along the lines of quit while you're ahead. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with you about history. I, I think it, it's very informative. Well, obviously, that was, that was the premise of what I had to say. History informs our present, and while it doesn't predict the future, uh, it, it does make sense of it um, once we're in the future. <laughs> it makes it rational. Um, uh, yes, uh, well, I, I would like to say that uh, one of uh, adaptability and, and um, an openness to being open, to just appreciating that you might be given a very, you know, and we know this, like today, uh, 754.13 on uh, March the 30th, we know that change is not only constant, that, and it seems, in, and sometimes it seems to be getting faster, uh, and that it requires us to be really quick on our feet, use what we've got to deal with at least something that we have to deal with uh, in the future. Um, and, you know, living, even living in the present gives you lots of skills to understand what happens each moment. It's getting a little bit Zen Buddhist here, but, you know, what happens in the moment. And that, too, can be something, whether it's uh, resi resilience, adaptability, uh, you know, uh, information professionals are so great at using the information that may be dysfunctional or otherwise to uh, deal with whatever comes next. So that's kind of a wimpy answer, but I'm retired. Hello, Dr. Howarth. Um, neither your, co your colleague nor your student. <laughs> Sorry. But I am a librarian. Work it's a voice. <laughs> Um, nice to see you. But in a, nice to meet you. But um, in a previous life, I was a linguist. And thinking of language as it changes, I was mm. so glad that you mentioned working within the community. Because that's where language grows and develops. Language is always developing. And the most that a, a, um, an AI can do with language is learn what, what humans have created. We're um, creating meaning using it. So they can learn the code, but they can't create the meaning. They're going to be learning it from us. And it's a matter of just depriving an AI of its source of data, human speech or human text, and it will stop growing. It will stop learning from us. And whatever it develops, they're not social beings among themselves. They would create a language that, we don't, that doesn't make sense to us, that we can't use. So I don't really see the danger there unless we replace essential workers, um, essential tools, essential social institutions and cultural institutions with machines. Like, I think that we're safe as long as we don't let them take over. But that really is in our hands. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that, that's just such a helpful perspective, the linguistic uh, perspective. Um, Ma Madam Timekeeper, if I could be allowed one quick thing. Uh, Patrick referred to um, work that Kara and I had, had done uh, with some indigenous seniors at the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto. And uh, Kara taught me a lot about being in and with a community. I am not of the community. Uh, and, you know, for folks, especially academics who are used to talking to, sometimes at people, you have to listen. That's, you, you just listen. And one of the things that we were advised by uh, an, an elder, um, uh, Jackie, when we first started was, uh, uh, this was really helpful. Without food, there can be no conversation. <laughs> That's almost a segue to the reception. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Quite, quite by chance, but in, in any case, you know, I think what you've just said is beautiful uh, and incredibly helpful. And uh, I would suggest that you send a text to Elon Musk immediately. <laughs> 
and just cut off that <laughs> source of data. But thank you very much. I really appreciate those comments. I'm over here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not part of the uh, Faculty of Information, uh, although I've thought about it before. But as a reasonably intelligent human being, I uh, have a kind of a basic question. And I remember in around 2016, a lot of uh, American librarians were trying to capture a lot of uh, websites that pertain to the US government uh, before they got, I guess, in essence, uh, digitally burned. So can AI uh, determine what is worth keeping in the long run before it gets digitally burned? What a, what a lovely question. And actually, we have an expert in the room uh, because Patrick was involved in that uh, process. Go ahead, on the spot. You put me on the spot. Now it's my turn, but no. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm sorry, your question was, can... Uh, AI determine uh, what should be retained before it gets digitally burned? Okay, so I think our role in that is to determine what absolutely must uh, be preserved, right? And I think that was one of the things that all of you did because there was an awful lot of stuff. Uh, and how did you go about determining what should? Well, we Can people hear, maybe? Uh, web crawler couldn't capture. Yeah, thank you. So the, uh, Lynn's referring to a group of us who, um, when Trump was first elected, he, he's been indicted, by the way. Um, but um, when Trump was elected, um, we tried to preserve the data that was on the Environmental Protection Agency's website because a new administration was going to take it down and there was a lot of incredibly valuable data, but web crawlers were unable to you know, capture everything. So we actually worked with the uh, Internet Archive and built a um, Chrome extension to just easily, um, it did require, it wasn't completely automated, but to basically easily capture data that wouldn't have been captured by a basic web crawler. So, Fair to say that human intervention sort of described the parameters, and AI would, of course, given its speed and uh, abilities, capabilities for handling large amounts of data, might have made it a little bit faster. Matt, is that reasonable? I mean, I think you need human discernment. This is the point we keep coming back to. Yeah. Automated systems are easily fooled. You need humans in the room. And Just no remember that if you encounter a robot, they're easily fooled. <laughs> <laughs> and we're coming to our very last question now. <laughs> Thank you, by the way, uh, for the question. Uh, this has been fascinating for me. I'm not an academic, and I'm not a librarian at all. But uh, actually... Saved. <laughs> but I love libraries. But uh, the, what the lady was just saying uh, was, is somewhat similar to my thought in terms of my question, in that can we use artificial intelligence to give us a better sense of the impact of artificial intelligence on society, on our library systems, et cetera, et cetera, and use it essentially to save ourselves? Hmm. Has anyone got the uh, Institute on Speed Dial? Yes. I, I, um, Thank you. By the way, I love your lecture. Thank it you. was amazing. I heard you were going to speak, and I researched you, and that's why I came. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. I thought I would just listen, but I think I ended up writing like four pages of notes, all quoted by you. <laughs> so Publish thank it. you. Um, yeah, I love your question, because I, I am guilty. I actually work with a robot every day. Um, I didn't know that's what the talk was going to be on, but we do use the robot, that Q1 Pepper, to actually prepare children for surgery. And there's research out there that actually has shown um, that children with autism and pervasive developmental disorder will copy, pardon me, a robot and practice with the anesthetic induction mask more and interact more with the robot than a human. And the reason is for exactly what you had shared, Lynn, because a robot doesn't get distracted, doesn't get tired of the child, and will repeat, repeat, repeat. So we had some instances 
where we were able to get kids in the operating room, put on the anesthetic induction mask, and have a lovely experience because they got to practice with one of those robots. But when that letter came out, a bunch of us and colleagues, we thought they're putting it out because it's probably another country spying on us and they're probably taking <laughs> all our data <laughs> and we're sitting here telling all our secrets in front of these robots constantly <laughs> all day. But the funny thing is um, I had a kid come up to me once when I was wearing my badge and kept pushing my badge and it took me a while to realize, <laughs> oh my God, he thinks I'm a robot too. <laughs> So it can be used for good. <laughs> and then you turned on the empathy and the whole ruse was yeah. destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that's that very, you know, the, the big brother, sister, you know, ro robots are, have us in their sights. I think there's no better time to go to the bar. Uh, <laughs> I accept yeah, that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So, yeah, it's my great pleasure now to introduce Wendy Duff, the Dean of the Faculty of Information. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us for the 17th Bertha Bascom Lecture, Beyond Binding and Binaries, with our wonderful Professor Lynn Howarth. Um, as always, and, and I've known Lynn for actually since Big Blue came and beat <laughs> in 1997. And through that time, she has always reminded us both of the past, the present, helped us understand the future, but most important, I think, for all of us who know Lynn and had this incredible privilege, what it is to be human, not only in our discussions, but actually as this role model that Lynn has always played. So thank you so much, Lynn. Once again, she has helped us. As some of you may know, Professor Lynn Howarth retired from the faculty in 2021, and we had the pleasure of celebrating the milestone in person earlier this year. I am also pleased to announce that Lynn, the faculty has established a new student award to honor Lynn's remarkable legacy, the Lynn C. Howarth Award for Innovative Design and Delivery of Information Services to Equity Deserving Communities will be conferred to a master level student at the Faculty of Information engaging in research and or volunteer work with equity deserving communities with a focus on innovative design and or delivery of information services, very much a reflection of Lynn, her work and her commitment to the faculty and I would also say society. We are immensely grateful for those of you who have already contributed to this award. Your generosity has been truly remarkable. As, the, as for the campaign, we're thrilled to report that it's garnered support from more than 60 individuals and resulted in an impressive sum of over $16,000 raised. To show our commitment towards this cause, we want you all to know that the Faculty of Information will continue to match every donation dollar for dollar up to $25,000. We cordially invite you to join our campaign as we strive to create a new award to recognize and financially support students in Lynn's honor. Our current shortfall is $9,000 and your valuable contribution can help us achieve our target. We are thrilled to have gained so much momentum and we intend to maintain this enthusiasm until the end of the term when the campaign concludes. Your donation, however, the, whatever the amount, is significant to us and we appreciate your support, any support you can provide for the cause. To learn more about the gift, uh, the back of your card uh, gives you some information. Once again, I'd like to thank you to join us tonight for this lecture and we hope you can gain valuable insight into the future. And I actually want to also thank the incredible insightful contributions that you all gave when you asked questions and contributed. But I also have to say that we also know about Lynn, about as a teacher, she wasn't just that she had so much knowledge to share, but she always sparked such great ideas in that class where everyone contributed. And I think we have seen her do that again tonight. So thank you all. And now, I believe, I'm gonna hand it back to Victoria, and I think there's food and drink in the future. And that's all I wanted to say, was thank you very much, and please join us outside for uh, a glass of something to keep your voice clear and a little bite to eat. <laughs>